Hey guys, it's Anne. Welcome to the channel. Today we are going to look in on the European Nightcrawlers and talk about the weird things you can put into a worm bin that nobody tells you you can do. It's been about four weeks since we've been in here, so let's see if we can get a little bit of a harvest to make some room for today's feeding. All right, I'm going to put you down and let's get going. Okay, so I'm just going to pick off the top here and uh, try and get something of a harvest. Things have dried off quite a bit down here. And uh, so hopefully we'll get a better harvest than we did last time. Put in the comments below, how often do you harvest and feed your worm bin? I do mine about every four weeks. And the top part here is going to be super dry. So I'm not gonna have to worry about any worms or anything having been in here. And you are seeing some colored paper, but at this point, I don't know if that is just because I made a mistake and it got over here or if it's not digestible. So I'm going to go ahead and still put this in the end where I'm going to feed and we'll give it another opportunity to succeed at um, getting through the worm and the rest of the ecosystem here. So we are finally, I think, getting into for real winter now and the furnace is on full time. All of those methods that I'm using to keep the worm bins nice and uh, even with their moisture are going to be even more important now. On this bin in here, I haven't had too many problems with moisture, uh, but the uh, other bins have already started to dry out. So you can tell this is what happens when the worm castings completely dry out 100%. They get hard as a rock. So that's that's not helping me. <laughs> so I'm gonna put that back into the other end and it'll get moist again, and hopefully it can get done the next time. So today, one of the things that we're going to do, aside from talk about all those things you can put in a worm bin that nobody tells you about, is I'm also going to start my sweet potatoes today so that they can start growing so that I can get some good slips so I can plant in June. I don't know about you guys, but the people that send out the sweet potato slips, send them out in June. By the time I get roots in the jar and everything, it's already too late. And I didn't get a really great harvest last year. So I saved some of those potatoes or sweet potatoes and I'm gonna do it myself this year. It's not the best harvest, but it'll get me enough to do what I need to do. So if you're ever interested in getting these screens, I have those in my Amazon links below. I really just use the quarter inch or the eighth inch the most. So if you can only afford to buy one, that's the one that I would buy. And there we go. We're getting some nice castings here. You can still see the eggshell in there. Um, that will take quite some time to degrade. If you are putting in a lot of eggshell and you want it to become bioavailable faster, you can always soak it in vinegar and dissolve it before putting it in the garden, not in your worm bin. Just a little tip there. All right, I'm going to try and get another couple of handfuls here, but I think that's all that the moisture is going to allow me to sift today because we are getting down into it being a little bit too wet, which turns into um, hard crusty little pills if you try and sift when it's too wet. And I'm not in a big hurry, it is only January. All right, not a great amount, but that is definitely enough to get started with the sweet potatoes. Okay, one of the things that I, I wanted to address the questions from the video the last time that I had the European Nightcrawlers. And one of the people had asked me, why do you put things in there like avocado pits and pumpkin stems and things like that that are going to take forever? And, you know, part of me is like the outside compost pile is like 500 feet from my house. So in the wintertime, I really don't want to uh, take the trek through the frozen tundra to uh, take it to my outside. But then again, also, I think that it helps. One of the things that you see a problem with in the worm bins is that it compacts over time. And having these large chunky bits actually helps keep the air inside the bin and makes little pockets where the worms can get air in case things do get compacted. Kind of helps a little bit there 
because the worms need moisture and they need air, and that's kind of a hard thing to accomplish at the same time, is to keep it wet enough that the worms are happy and want to breed and eat, and then also have them enough air that it, you know is good enough for them to be healthy and breathe. They do breathe through their skin, so they need to have little pockets where they can definitely get enough air. And by having those hard chunky bits in here, and even though they're not going to cycle very quickly in you know a month or even six months, they are going to be uh, beneficial to the worm bins. So the moisture is reducing overall, which is good. I should be able to get in here and harvest more over the next couple of months as I need to start seed starting. Let me know, are you guys starting any seeds uh, right now? I have already started my super hots and some indoor tomatoes. I recently got a aero garden and basically, if you don't know what that is, it's a little hydroponic system where you put seeds in a little plug and then they kind of circulate the nutrients in the water. I also do what is called the Kratky system, and that's what I grow like lettuce and herbs and whatnot over the course of the winter. And that's just a, a mason jar with some nutrients in it. And that's just, you buy it, I think for the most part, you can probably get it at a big box store, um, any sort of uh, hydroponic nutrients. And it just comes in a bottle and you follow the directions online for whatever thing you're trying to grow. And in my case, it's mostly leafy greens, but I occasionally try to do tomatoes or peppers. I have managed to get tomatoes out of doing that, but they did take something like six months. So when I thought that I was going to plant them and get tomatoes during the winter, you would have to start planting your hydroponic tomatoes when you have outside tomatoes for them to get done by the time winter is around. So if that's something you're interested in, make a note of that because I, if somebody did tell me that, I didn't pick up on it. So if you're looking for hydroponic tomatoes in the winter, you gotta start them in the summer because with the reduced light and temperature in your house, they don't grow as fast as they do when they're outside. That's just my personal experience. I'm sure some people have some elaborate, you know, greenhouses and stuff that you can grow them just as fast inside, but I do not. I just have my basement in my uh, upstairs room where I keep the African night crawlers and my orchids and bonsais. All right, we're getting to the middle here, and the middle is where it is probably three months old where the food is. So you can see a little bit of paper. You see quite a bit of worms. And they are still working in progress here. And there's obviously something to eat because they're still here. All right, well, getting it is a little bit compacted at the bottom. Now, the, the wedge system that I'm working with here is basically a continuous flow through system that's horizontal. So kind of like the urban worm bag or the vermi bag where you're putting things in one end and it comes out the other in about, um, well, once it gets flowing about every month you can harvest. This is meant to do the same thing. All right, now let me flip you over and we'll look at the business end of the bin. Okay, well, we've got the bedding from last time here and then all the things we just harvested. I'm gonna put those over out of the way put that on the tray up here. I'll mix those in when we get the feeding. Put that below so that it can get um, wet again so the worms can eat it. And the isopods and everything else that's that's living in here. Piece of jade trying to grow. So one of the things that I wanted to address today with the things you can put in a worm bin that nobody tells you, I just want to start out by saying that everybody is very fearful these days. Everybody's worried about chemicals and microplastics and diseases and, I mean, while those are still all real things, when you're looking at your worm bin, worms are not humans, obviously, and they don't really feel or are subject to the same problems that we are. So microplastics aside, um, you know, that's... That's just something we have to live with in the modern world. And aside from not participating and using plastics, there's not a lot we can do. 
it's not like wood where it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller and eventually it just is completely disintegrated. Apparently how small a piece of plastic can become is somewhat infinite and uh, you never know where it is. Apparently people have found it in bloodstreams of animals. But that's not what we're here to talk about today. Today we're talking about not being so fearful about what you put in your bin. So if we just look at something as simple as tomato and onions and peppers, these worms do not have the same nerves that we do. They do not have the same sensory organs that we do. So when people tell you not to put in things like hot peppers, they're assuming that worms have the same sort of uh, mechanisms that we do, and they do not. They cannot perceive capsation. Similarly, when people talk about, oh no, like tomatoes are too acidic, that's assuming that they're just living in tomatoes, quite honestly. What you have here is a whole bunch of paper and cardboard that is going to even out that pH. And worms in the wild, cue the furnace, the worms in the wild, you know, honestly, are where they are. So if there's something slightly acidic, they just move. So I just want everybody to realize you don't need to be quite as fearful about all of those things that people who are just repeating dogma over and over again have told you. Feeding something that is a little acidic or feeding something like lemons and limes, yes, they do have the compound that worms may not be comfortable with, but it does get broken down into other compounds by the other creatures in the bin. And then basically it's no longer that thing that worms aren't comfortable around and then the worms can come in and eat it. So that's why I say that it's an ecosystem in a bin. It's not just the worms. Um, and that's, that's the goal is to not just have a bin of, of compost worms. You're looking for a compost ecosystem, just like your outside compost. If you dig into an outside compost, you find all kinds of things and you know, people worry a lot less about what they put in an outside compost, but your inside compost can be pretty similar in the kind of things that it can digest. So this is a ficus leaf. Ficus has um, latex sap in it, and the worms will take a very long time to be able to get in there and eat it, at least until all the rest of the critters have had a chance to break down the things that the worms can't get at. And that's fine. It's not a race. It's a worm bin. And so I would just want to make sure that everybody is not so stressed out about every little thing that you're putting in the worm bin. Like, you know, the office paper. Oh, it's been bleached. Well, as we know with um, municipal water, things that have been bleached, the bleach evaporates over time. And then also they, they worry about like cereal boxes. Well, there are a lot of new rules and regulations about what food packaging can have in it as far as different chemicals. Those are laws within the United States and Canada and probably most of the EU. Not an expert on the EU. But I do know about the United States and the food manufacturing um, world and I can tell you that there's a list of things you cannot have and those are probably the things you are most worried about. So they won't be in there to get into your garden and harm you, you know, in the future. All right, we're getting down to the end here. And last time we backed off of the feeding a little bit because they did have leftovers, quite a few leftovers. Here's that piece of uh, squash. There's a little bit of that left. I don't know if we're going to find a proper worm ball. But, you know, if you find that your worms have leftover food, then don't feed as heavy that next time. And it'll all even out. I mean, that's the biggest worry is to feed too much and then it starts hot composting and that could physically damage your worms. That's definitely something you don't want to do. But as far as what kind of food you feed them, if it's the kind of food that you will eat, they can eat it. Okay, so we are getting somewhere here. I don't see a whole lot of leftovers. 
just that one piece of, of melon was left over, so we can go ahead and give them a really good feeding. And the feeding you're gonna see is gonna be very surprising. Most people, you know, think that uh, leftover people food is not something that the worms can do. So if you've made a casserole or soup or something like that, a lot of people won't try to make that go to the worm bin. As I am ever on the mission to find <clears throat> the exhaustive list of what the worms can and cannot process, I am forever feeding them things similar to that. All right, so it looks like we've got a good amount of room here that we can feed them a good feeding today. So first things first, I'm gonna get them some of their shredded bedding. Okay, so I'm just gonna get them a nice layer of the shredded cardboard and paper. This has just been soaked in a little bit of warm water. And let's get them some of their new food and we'll talk about the food. First things first, we have another piece of that squash. These squash are about two and a half feet long and uh, it's just a lot to eat all at once. <laughs> so unfortunately the ends end up not really getting finished a lot of the time. But it's a winter squash so you can't pick it early and eat it like you can with summer squash. It just, it is what it is. And then the second thing we have here is lentil soup. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to work in this stuff that we pulled out of the screen and I'm going to kind of squish that into it so that it is not a solid brick of lentils. Now a lot of people are, were probably thinking, oh my gosh, what about protein poisoning? And quite honestly, protein poisoning isn't really protein poisoning. Protein poisoning is when a worm will eat something and then it basically, whatever it is, ferments in their gut, causing them to blow up. So that is, you know, one of the things that I try to do is make sure things don't hot compost and also don't ferment in here. So you try and make sure that that's not the only food that they have available. And by me pressing this old stuff into it, the worms have lots of options to get away from it. Now that will probably be a longer term food, so I'm gonna feed them some fast food as well. All right, so here goes the fast food. We've got some cabbage that the bag got thrown to the back of the refrigerator and froze and not really people quality at this point, which is a shame because I had planned on making some kimchi. And then we've got some red beans and rice. You know, that last little scoop that nobody wants. Got some cauliflower in here that got frozen as well. And then all of this is fine. Like the red beans and rice, yes, there are spices in here. Yes, there's a little bit of salt, but not enough that you can't dilute it out with the, um, the bedding that I'm gonna put on top as well. I just wanna remind you that it's not just the worms who are gonna eat this. So you've got the roly polies, the little isopods, you've got the mites and the springtails and whatever else I can't see without a microscope in here eating on this food. So it's not just about what can the worms eat, it's about what can the system eat. So then the other critters eat the stuff and then the worms eat it second, which is kind of gross from a human point, from a human perspective, but uh, they're not humans and they don't know any better. So I'm gonna give them quite a bit of bedding here. Cabbage and broccoli and things like that do tend to smell, so I wanna make sure there's a good topping of bedding on top of here so that the smell doesn't get loose. Okay, so here we go. This is the new bedding and the new food in the wedge. This part is what was worked upon two to three months ago. And then this part down here is what's been going for about six months. And that's the wedge system. So if you're interested in seeing more about the European Nightcrawlers, I have a playlist that you can look at right over there. And if you've already seen that, YouTube has another suggestion for a video that you will enjoy as well. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms, and everybody have a good day.